Good morning. Good morning. Aren't you glad that you can be in God's house today? I am. I always look forward to the time when we can be together as a family of God. And we're going to start this morning by singing from our hymn books. Turn to number 563. 563. Count your blessings. Do you ever do that? I think it's so important. When we get defeated and feel down, start counting the things that God has done that's really been good in your life. It works. Trust me, it does. Let's sing it together. Let's stand as we sing it, okay? When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your See what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? <clears throat> Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the day. sing this and our pastor just loved to do this. He said God gives us so many blessings you can't just count them one by one. So he said count your blessings, name them two by two. Count your blessings, name them four by four. Count your blessings, name them by the score. Count your many blessings, there are millions more. Think you can remember that when we get to the chorus? 
So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you till the turns in two by two. Count your blessings, name them two by two. nothing else to do today, start counting your blessings. You may be seated. Amen. I'd like to, whoops, to Babylon. Can you tell me what I saw and what it means? Take me to the king. Out of the gods. Out of Babylon. Bow to me. What do I do? Here is the prisoner. He is a traitor of Babylon and an enemy of the king. What do you see? Do you hear? I'm on my knees crying out. King of kings, Lord of all things,
sight and sound presentation at Tinseltown in Erie, August the 30th through September the 2nd. It is a wonderful, musical, and powerful presentation of the life and testimony of Daniel. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just really, really so moving and encouraging. So I'd like to invite you to stand with me this morning. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that's going to be uh, along with our lesson today. But stand with me and we'll, then we'll unite our hearts in prayer uh, together. I'll be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 7 and following. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and of discipline. Your version may say a sound mind there. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Holy Father, we come to you in Jesus' name this morning, and we're excited when we think about all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus and things that uh, we'll, we will not even be aware of until we step into eternity, and more of that is even revealed to us, Lord, but we are aware of a lot of those blessings, and Lord, we don't want to be guilty of, of, of minimizing those blessings, of, of overlooking a single one of them. We don't want to be guilty of not being thankful and grateful to overflowing for all the ways that you show yourself faithful in our lives and strengthen us by your blessings and by your grace, Lord, day by day. So we want to certainly be mindful of those things, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the body of Christ here today as we gather in the name of Jesus, Lord. We gather to, to lift up and exalt Christ. We gather to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Uh, we gather to worship together, to fellowship together, to encourage one another, all the more as the day of our Lord Jesus approaches, day by day, O oh Lord, nearer and nearer. Therefore, our encouragement must become more and more steadfast for one another. So, Lord, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for this beautiful, glorious Lord's Day. Thank you for the various ways that you showed yourself faithful in the lives of each of us this week. And Lord, we want to we wanna thank you and I ask you to continue to use us as you've called us by your power and glory in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to remain standing to sing this first song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Aren't you glad you can trust in him? I'm trusting you, Lord. <laughs> He's been faithful, he's been true, and we can trust him, can't we? We're going to sing the first verse, it's on page 350 if you want to use your hymn book. Verses, stanzas three and four, one, three, and four. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust him more. Verse 3, yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life, rest, and joy, and How I trust him, how I've proved him more and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust him more. 
I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust Him more. Amen. You want grace to trust Him even more. You may be seated and you can turn in your hymnals to number 409. I got to get my book. This is a good way to memorize the scripture. This is a scripture, 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed. Do you know him? You do. You know he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. in love redeemed before his own but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that
Boom! Out of nothing, a whole planet appears. Stars, a sun, a moon, water, and land. Then animals and plants, the first man, and soon a beautiful lady. But then drama unfolds as they're given a choice whether to obey their creator or listen to a sinister snake and are tempted to eat forbidden fruit. Well, we all know how that story ended. And we've been paying the price for that choice for centuries. But first, let's have some fun. I'm gonna fly my trusty drone up into the sky. I'm gonna zoom down over my church down toward a mysterious object. And you, well, you get to try and guess what I'm zooming in on. And you yell out what you think it is as soon, well, as soon as you think you can tell. And once I get up close, I'll tell you what it is, if you haven't guessed already. Okay, are you ready? All right, let, let me switch over to my drone camera. All right, okay, that's up there. All right, let me zoom down, let me zoom down. Okay, there's my church. Okay, I'm gonna start coming down, coming down. All right, see the parking lot. Start looking, looking for something and see if you can tell what it is. All right, uh, I see some rocks in the sidewalk. Oh, that's the mailbox. But there's something on the mailbox. See if you can tell what it is. Oh, what is that? It's red, that's on top of the mailbox. Oh, I think I, I think I heard some of you know what it is. What is it, what is it? Oh, what, what, what's that? What? An apple, you got it. Yes, yes, it was an apple. You guys are pretty fast. Now, in all fairness to apples, it wasn't an apple that Adam and Eve ate. We don't really know what kind of fruit it was. In the Bible, it was just called the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, that's a really long name. So people often called an apple, but it could have been any kind of fruit or a special fruit that doesn't even exist anymore. The point isn't what kind of fruit it was. The point is just that it was something God told them not to eat. The point is just that God gave them one thing not to do. One thing. And that one thing he gave them not to do is the one thing they did do. Wouldn't it be nice if your mom and dad or whoever cares for you gave you just one thing you couldn't do? I bet you have more than just one rule in your house. But like Adam and Eve, I know you've broken a rule or two. How do I know that? Well, because I have too. In fact, the Bible says that everyone has sinned and, well, fallen short of God's perfect standard. Yep, Adam and Eve failed their test. You and me, well, we failed too. But that's where the good news comes in. I'm sure you've heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the word gospel means good news? Well, you can't have good news without bad news. You see, it's the bad news that makes the good news good. You can't have good news without bad news. It's the baddest of the bad news that makes the good news of the good news so good. And the bad news, well, it's that we've all sinned, meaning we've all done bad things. And the good news is that Jesus still loves us. And he came to make a way for us to be forgiven and to have our friendship with God be restored. The Bible says that nothing at all can separate us from God's love. That's because what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. That's found in Romans chapter 8, verse 39b. Let's say that again. Nothing at all can separate us from God's love. That's because of what Christ Jesus our Lord has done. Romans chapter 8, verse 39b. The B's because it's the second half of the verse. So even though you've done some bad things, cheer up. God loves you. And because of Jesus, you can be forgiven and still go to heaven someday. You see, Jesus defeated sin so that you can have a friendship with God. And that's the word from Wilbur. Awesome. for the good news. Um, anybody have anything to share today?
phrases. I have one. Okay. You know, when we were singing that song, Terry, I was thinking that whole song, almost the whole song is what we don't know. The whole song is what we're not sure of, except the chorus. And it's the most important thing. But you know, I don't understand all the doctrines necessarily. I don't understand the mind of God fully. But one thing we can know for sure, we know who we believe in. And that he has taken care of our sins and we will spend eternity with Wilbur. I mean with him and with Wilbur one day in eternity. And I just find that hymn so, so I love that hymn. Because we are allowed to express our ignorance about a lot of things. But our faith and profess our faith and assurance in the person of Jesus, what he's done for us. Amen to that. Yes. Anyone else have anything to share? Well, it's nice to be back. We've been doing things with family the last couple of weeks. And I'm thankful going down to Virginia, we about eight downpours and they were almost like whiteouts. I mean, we had to have our flashers on with the, the pouring rain and uh, then it would be dry and then come again. And, uh, you know, 20, 35 miles an hour and then pulling off because it was so bad. So thankful for the Lord's protection. All right. We can go to prayer then. I'm going to give another little testimony. <clears throat> I was hoping my wife would do it. But uh, she noticed last week and this week that her left hand that was affected by the stroke when she began to play the piano, she's be able to use it freely. She struggled, that left hand was not working very well. But uh, it's working good now. And I just want to say thank you, Jesus, for answering that prayer and just giving her that special touch physically. Gracious Lord, we do want to count our blessings. Because even though we face some very difficult times as God's children, we're so glad that you're always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You're there to supply all of our need, whether it's financial, physical, spiritual, domestic, Whatever that need might be, Lord, oh, we thank you. You're there to minister. And that's why it's with confidence we come into your presence today, bringing our requests before you and thanking you, oh God, for ministering in a very special way. Lord, we want to remember Craig in prayer that's now in the hospital with pneumonia. On top of all the other problems that he's dealing with and a surgery that's supposed to come up pretty soon and now has to be scheduled for a heart catheterization on Monday. Lord, we just ask you to minister in a very special way. Take away any anxiousness that he might have. Just overshadow him with that inner peace that passeth all understanding. That wonderful peace that only you can bring. Thank you, Lord, for working in his heart and in his life. We continue to bring Crystal before you and pray, Lord, that these tests that they're working on at the Cleveland Clinic will help her to understand just what the problem is in her body. Lord, we're just trusting you and believing that you're going to work in a very special way. And Lord, we just continue to bring Tom before you thanking you for the very good reports that we're receiving and believing, God, that you will continue to work for him physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, every need, Lord, you know, and we'll thank you for meeting. We want to also pray for Glenn and ask God that you'll continue to minister to his need and to his brother and sister-in-law. You know their situation as well. And we're believing, oh God, that you will work in a very special way. Be with Wilma's sister Harriet with this uh, lung cancer. And oh God, we pray that as she goes through these tests that you will be with her in a very special way. 
take away any anxiousness that might be present, and we'll thank you, we'll not fail to give you praise. We covet your protection over Jonathan and Faith as they travel back to us today and tomorrow. Oh God, just give them traveling mercies. This is a long, drawn out thing. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just help them. Give them strength, give them rest, and we'll thank you. We're glad that we can place the wars, the rumors of wars, all in through a God who we know is in control. We pray, Lord, that you would minister and you would work in a very special way. And Lord, with that confidence in our heart, we rest in you. We believe, Lord, that there is a rest to the children of God. And we claim that rest today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our hymn books to number 500. Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight. Aren't you thankful for the peace that God gives? He can give us peace. I think of a, a I think I shared this story before, but I feel like I want to share it again. I had a friend, her name is Frances Yor. The Lord blessed her. She's written several songs in our hymn book. And she went to her sister, who was going through a terrible marriage issue. She had a husband that was here today and gone tomorrow. And this was one of those occasions when he had left once again. And she said to her, I don't understand. Why do you have such a calm and a peace about you? With all that's going on, your husband's such a mess. What, what, what do you have to be content about? She looked at her and she said, Abiding in Christ, I have peace. I love that. In the midst of all that she was facing, she had a peace that passeth all understanding. Wonderful peace. Let's sing it. Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song. In celestial like strength it unceasingly falls for my soul. Yeah. 
The torch that God had lit upon the earth has now been extinguished. Who could rekindle it or dissipate the gross darkness now brooding over the desolate regions which had so lately been pronounced very good? To the unfallen creation, how fearful the disaster must have seemed. God's purpose seemed frustrated. His power seemed baffled. His wisdom appeared defeated. His very throne was assailed. Who could now deem himself secure? Who might not in like manner among us fall? The highest creature throne in heaven has no longer a safe place. For who could assure himself that this flood of evil, now broken loose, might not swell up till it left nothing but the throne of God himself untouched? I thought it was interesting because it's so focused, he's so focused, and I think communicates so well the, the hor horrific effect that sin has had on humankind. We uh, probably seldom, I seldom think, I guess, that deeply about sin. I use the word a lot, I use the concept a lot, but my mind is not taking in all of this, and there's a lot there regarding regarding sin and the fall. So we're looking at God's purpose. Um, at the fall of creation, mankind sinks into the curse, into the curse. How hopeless and helpless was mankind. All of creation was affected except God himself. And we read that, it was mentioned by Horatio Bonar. All human history is stories of the sinful, broken creation devising broken systems in attempts to fix its own brokenness. That's what good works are, oftentimes good works. We've got to work really hard to, to fix this mess that we're in. Yet from the beginning in the Old Testament, we see what we typically perceive as a New Testament principle shining through the darkness. For where sin so greatly abound, grace aboundeth more. Where grace, I'm sorry, where sin so greatly abounded, grace does much more abound. There couldn't be a more reassuring verse, I think, in all of Scripture. Wherever sin abounds, God's grace abounds all the more. So today we're going to look about look a bit look a little bit about God's grace and try to understand it a little bit better. We've sort of understood the horrific nature of sin, thanks to Horatio Bonar, but hopefully we're going to look and see a little bit more of the of the glorious grace of our Lord Jesus. Grace can be defined from an English perspective. You don't find this in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, but grace is defined as elegance or refinement or even courtesy. That's not the biblical definition of it, but that's our English sort of cultural definition of it. We might use it in the, in the sentence like, the queen is a lady of great grace. She's refined. She's elegant. The Olympic swimmer moves through the waters with such grace and skill. It has nothing to do with biblical grace, but it's how our culture, English culture, addresses or defines grace. Grace from biblical perspective is divine influence and one of the Greek lexicons said it's divine influence on the heart and its reflections into life. That was sort of a summary of God's grace. Divine influence on the heart and its reflection in this life. We know that grace is a gift. The word gift and grace is kind of synonymous in the New Testament, especially sometimes the same Greek word is just translated 
a little bit differently just because of the context and how it was used. For grace, as we look at the creation account in Genesis, we notice the order of the creation account is of utmost importance. Seven, six, six days of creation, the seventh day of rest. We see that what God created first was necessary preparation for what was to be created next. What, aren't you glad God figured that one out before we came along? God created land before he created land animals. God created um, birds or, or sky before he created birds of the sky. God brought about water before he created fish to swim in the water or animals that need water uh, as their environment. So he created all these things. One was one step in preparation for the next. How God's provision was always there for what was coming next. Provision for life was in place before the next form of life came into being that would need such a particular provision. And as the God of life, we would expect to see life come from him as the giver of life. Life is part of what God does. It's part of his essence. It's part of his activity. It's who he is. It's what he does. He is the God of all life, and all life finds its source in him. So the order that we see in creation in Genesis can help us understand the biblical principle of the New Testament or where we typically ascribe that principle to come from. And as from God, the God of all life, comes life. Likewise, grace comes from the God of all grace. He is the God of all grace. He's the God of peace. He's the God of joy. He's the God of love. He's the God of grace, the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 5 speaks of the source of grace in our lives. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 be sensible and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking someone he may devour. Him firmly you must resist in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions in the world are being completed in your, by your brotherhood. But the God of all grace, but the God of all grace, here's the devil, here's sin, here's, sin, here's his destruction, here's his plan, all of this, but the God of all grace, his calling to us, his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a little, he will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's what the God of all grace does. That's his job. That's what he does. He perfects. He confirms. He strengthens. He establishes us no matter what we're facing not where, whatever we're, uh, is going on in our life, whatever stress, whatever difficulties, the God of all grace is there. In fact, the God of all grace had his grace available and abounding before our problems ever even arose. To him, the next verse says, to him be glory and the might forever. The grace of God is purposed to accomplish four things for our faith. To perfect us, that is, whatever is lacking in our faith, to complete that. To confirm it. It's almost the word that means to document something. To no take note of it. To make it plain. To record it. This is, this is what has happened. To strengthen us wherever we are weak, God's grace gives us strength and to establish you or to prepare us for that which he has called us to do or to be involved in. So when human beings were created and brought to life, the life-sustaining environment around us was already in place. When each was created, life was already fully abounding. So when sin arrived in the world, God's grace was already much more abounding and immediately available for all of mankind's needs. 
in his time of brokenness. So God doesn't say, ah, oh, sin, they ate the apple. Good grief, what were they thinking? Now what am I going to do? As we read in Timothy this morning, the purpose of his grace was already provided in at work before the world began. You know, who can get their mind around all of that? So our sin and our difficulties and problems have not caught God off, God off guard. They've not kind of taken him by surprise. In fact, he has a solution already for every problem. He has an answer that was answered before the world was formed for all the questions that we have. Praise his name, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For by one man's offense, death reigned, and by one, much more, they receive abundant grace, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one offense, sentence came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, and that one is a capital O, and the one that is Christ comes the free gift, and it came to all men to the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many more were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall all be made righteous, that is, all who believe. But the law entered so that the offense might abound. In Romans 5, verse 20. But where sin abounded, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So that as sin has reigned unto death, so grace must reign through righteousness to eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. I just love, just love reading these things. Wow, they're just, uh, it's, it's, it just says so much about what God has done to provide for the sinful nature and the hopelessness of mankind. And we're not worthy of any of it, right? The God of all life is the source of all life. Likewise, the God of all grace is the source of all grace, sufficient and fully abounding for every need and every trial and every difficulty that we would face. Where God is, his character is, his attributes are, his grace is, so that God's grace was already fully abounding before the need of grace ever arose. Take a minute and just think about that. God had his, God had life, provisions for life before the life that needed that provision ever came into being. God had the provision of sufficient abounding grace for the problems of mankind before mankind ever appeared on the scene. Grace was fully abounding before sin ever abounded. That concept right there touches, I believe, about every doctrine of the Christian faith from one side or the other. So that's the definition a little bit of grace and the source of grace. I want us to think and try to focus mostly on the purpose of grace, grace and its purpose today. The purpose of grace, of the grace of God, is to bring glory to God. Ultimately, that is the end goal. The purpose of the grace of God is to bring glory to God. Glory is the awesome praiseworthiness of who God is. And it's interesting that God was planning to use his grace through the lives of believers in the church that we call the Church of Jesus Christ over all times and all places. The Church of Jesus is the, not a denomination. The Church of Christ is not a denomination that the Bible refers to at least. But it is every person from the beginning of time that had ever trusted in Jesus are a part of that global, eternal church. God had a purpose 
in using his church and extending his grace to bring glory to himself, even to the heavenly beings and powers and dominions in heavenly places. Now, I was reading that and I was thinking, well, why do they have to know? I mean, if anybody ought to know, they were there. You know, they were, they were right there. They were, the angels were right there with God. I mean, they saw all of this. They've seen his glory more than we could. The fallen angels, I mean, they were there and then they fell. They know what's going on. They know about the glory of God. They know about the grace of God. They know about the power of God. And yet God has chosen to use his work of salvation in the life of sinful people to redeem them, to bring forgiveness as a display of his great power and glory to all the powers and dominions and authorities and rulers in heavenly places. So each of us are sort of trophies of God's grace. The Imperials had a song, Trophies of Grace. Anybody remember that song? Trophy. We are each trophies of grace. And each one of us, in a sense, is on a shelf of heaven. And God occasionally will call down to Satan. Satan, look up here on this shelf. Look at these people. Look what my grace has done. Look what you failed to do. Look at these trophies of grace. This is the church of Jesus Christ he's talking about. He wants to use the church to display his grace and glory to the powers in the heavenly places. So the purpose of God's grace is to display the vast unending resources of that grace. Ever feel like you alone are guilty of depleting all of God's grace? <laughs> the difficulties, the struggles of life, the struggles of our flesh, the struggles of our sinful nature, the, the disappointments that we disappoint ourselves. And you ever think, man, God must have really a load of, of, of a big pile of grace up there in heaven because I feel like I'm, I'm using it all up just for me. We can never deplete all of his grace. We can never overstay our welcome at his throne. Lord, I need your help again. Lord, it's me again, standing in the need of prayer, standing in the need of your grace. We can never, we can never overstay our welcome at the throne of our Lord Jesus. We can never deplete his grace. Ephesians 1, 7, verse following says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the, to the sprinkling of grace that he just barely gets on your life. According to the riches of his grace, that is the vast wealth, innumerable graces, the innumerable blessings, innumerable mercies that, his, that he has available for every one of us. According to the riches of his grace, which he caused to abound towards us in all wisdom and all understanding. The riches of his grace. We are all recipients of the riches of his grace. We have every blessing in Christ Jesus. And how can we even begin to fathom what that would be? But I really believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, just, I can't believe this was mine. I can't believe God had applied that to me. I can't believe that this was a part of my life down here, down there, and I never even knew it. So the purpose of God's grace was to display his grace and glory to the heavenly beings, but also to specifically uh, to help in our hearts and our lives and for all the things that affect us. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 says, For this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you nations, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me toward you, that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. He refers to this mystery several times. 
which in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, time when Paul wasn't existing, was not made known to the sons of men as it is now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the nations should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Of this gospel I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace that God has given me by the effectual working of his mighty power. This grace is given to me, who, and, and this is in parentheses in, in your Bible and my Bible. He says, and this grace is given to me, who, who, I am who am the least of the saints, parentheses broken now, to preach the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. You ever got, get the impression that Paul just can't find the words to express the true magnitude of the grace of God in the lives of his people. The riches of his grace. The unsearchable riches of his grace. How, what more can we say to, to, to help communicate how, how unimaginable his graces are abounding or really are. The unsearchable riches of Christ among the nations. And to bring to light what is the fellowship of this mystery from which which from eternity had been hidden in God who created all things by Christ Jesus. So that now, in Paul's time, in the time of Christ, so now to the rulers and the powers in heavenly places might be known that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God or the multifaceted wisdom of God according to the purpose which he has purposed us in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are like trophies of grace in God's redeeming, specifically the redeeming work of God, redeeming mankind, sending his son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross and shed his blood so that anybody who trusts in him can be forgiven. Not just the Jew, but all the nations, Paul says. It wasn't like that from the beginning, but now, through Christ, we realize that he brings into one that body, his church. The distribution of God's grace is intended to display God's glory. His redeeming grace is not only available to spiritual powers and beings, the church is the demonstration of God's grace to that part of creation. The church, how God brings us to be the church, how God takes Jeff's mess and, 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 and washes my sins away and redeems me and takes my past, my present, and prepares a future for me and a calling for you and for me and for each of us. How God can take a broken life, a broken people, a broken marriage, a broken nation, and by his abounding grace can put us all back together to get in, a, in a way that honors him and brings glory to God and causes all the spiritual powers of darkness in heaven and in hell to say, <sighs> would you look at that? Would you look at that? How about that? It's to bring all and glory to himself, to all creation. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For with this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named, that he would grant you according to the, guess what? Riches of his grace. Yes, yes, Lois. According to, I could read your lips. According to the riches of his grace, of his glory, I'm sorry, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in our inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may abound. And this doesn't actually, actually portray, uh, pertain to this. I want to say something since this Bible verse. That Christ may dwell. This is a prayer Paul is praying for the Ephesian churches. The, the internet is full of people kind of, they have this rant. 
You're not saved by accepting Jesus as your Savior. You're, accept, you're, you're saved by trusting in Jesus as your Savior. Okay, don't you have to be trusting in Him to accept Him into your, in your heart? Um, Rome, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 says, To all who received Him, NIV, but that word's the same word, accept. To all who received him, he gave the power to become children of God, particularly those who believe in his name. So they've got these rants that, that say, well, you, you got to say the right word. You, well, you know what? What you say is irrelevant. It's what we do believe. And a person, I think, has to be trusting in Christ to receive him, to accept him, if you want to use those words. Also, there's a rant that just blisters me. That you don't invite Jesus into your heart. Teaching children to invite Jesus into their heart is false. They're, they're not getting saved. They're not getting forgiven that way. He says, no, and they say no verse re, uh, addresses that. And I'm thinking, you can't get much more clear than this. Paul prays that Christ will dwell in their hearts by faith. Therefore, it's got to be right. When through faith we invite or pray to God or for others for Christ to fill their hearts and lives. I mean, how, how more clear can it be? God does want to, Christ to fill our hearts and to rule in our hearts. We should pray that he would purge out everything that's occupying our heart, that Christ himself would fill our hearts. I believe that. Yes. Never hesitate to help a child or an adult to ask Jesus to fill their heart, forgive their sins, and receive that gift of eternal life. To me, that's, a, that's just an that's just a expression of genuine faith. His grace displays his glory, and his glory is key to the mystery of the ages that he has provided grace for the sinner and he fills the hearts of his redeemed. God's purpose is for his children and is for Jesus Christ to fill our hearts for his teachings and his love and his Holy Spirit, even his forgiveness to fill our lives. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So I wanted to sort of end today regarding developing a heart of grace towards others. And from that question, I, I'm, I'm, again, it's a, it's a very important question. And the Bible has an answer to it. And um, I'm thankful for anybody who has that concern. With all the conversations, with all the relationships, with all the messes out there, with all the frustration, how can I develop a heart of grace? It's a biblical concern. Have grace in your hearts. So developing a heart of grace. Just some, just some ideas if you want to jot them down. If you have that concern, if you have that interest, developing a heart of grace towards others. Number one, um, devote yourself to serving as Jesus served and as Jesus spoke. Gracious speech can only come out of a heart of that is aligned with Christ's heart himself. Imagine the power and potential effect of seeing Jesus served and speaking, of, I'm sorry, of, of serving as Jesus served and of speaking as Jesus spoke. The words of grace, the words of Christ, how often when we're speaking to others, are we really, are we speaking as though Christ were speaking through us? Are we speaking words of grace as Christ would speak? 
the great words of grace, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how many times though that phrase is mentioned in the New Testament? I don't know, but it's a bunch. They're part of greetings. They're part of partings. They're part of wishes. They're part of blessings. They're parts of prayer throughout the New Testament. Peter, John, Paul, Jesus, grace to you, words of grace, Flow from a heart of grace. Devote yourself to serving as Jesus served and to speak as Jesus spoke. Secondly, devote yourself to developing a pattern of gracious speech that honors others and represents the words of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Colossians 4 verse 6, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious. Doesn't say when you feel like it. Doesn't say when the Holy Spirit's in full control. It says always speak words of grace. Well, I'm not sure about you, but I'm not quite there yet. So there's still some work to be done. Gracious speech can only come from a gracious heart. Filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. We must attempt to devote ourselves to reject Idle gossiping, meaningless, purposeless talk, uh, gossip, criticizing others. Focus on developing gracious speech. Gracious speech grows, uh, goes against our fallen human nature because we tend to criticize people. We tend to complain about things. So it does take some work. Gracious speech usually is an antithesis to what's in our human nature. Every day, put away idle words. Every morning, renounce continuous self-focused conversations. Put away a spirit of criticism and complaining. Repent from condescending thoughts that almost always manifest themselves in condemning words about others. Practice the very challenging task of self-restraint in our conversations. Every day, put away idle words. Every morning, continuously refocus our thoughts and ask God to fill our hearts with gracious speech. Thirdly, devote yourself to the all-important task of being a builder-upper and not a terror-downer. It's easy to be a terror-downer. It is easy to criticize people. It's not always easy to find a way to, to encourage other people, right? Oh, if I encourage her, she's going to not think I'm accepting of that conduct, so I'm not going to encourage her. I must rebuke that person. Not necessarily. Gracious speech cannot come from a critical, complaining heart. 1 Corinthians 10 says this, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things are build up. Paul was aware of that. Romans 14, 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Be a builder upper, not a terror downer. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. It is all too easy to see the negative things in people and circumstances and allowing that to color and occlude all the positive and blessedness of life of others and of our surroundings. Devote yourself to the all-important tasks of becoming a builder-upper rather than a terror-downer. And fourthly, devote ourselves, ourselves to putting others first in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our encounters, and put ourselves last, our conversations last, our storytelling last, and our personal sharing last. Gracious speech cannot live within a heart that's self-focused. The beautiful prayer the Lord gave Moses to give to Aaron to pray over the people can be read in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22 and following. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This you shall bless the people. With this you shall bless Israel. You shall say to them, He's saying, These are the words that I want said. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. That prayer is, the focus is you, 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 bless you upon you, gracious to you, to give you peace upon you. Not me, 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 but you. It's a prayer of blessing to others. It's a call for God's leaders to be gracious towards others, to be good stewards of God's grace. What do we do with the grace that God has given us? If we are abounding in grace, what in the world are we doing with it? Where is it going? Is it just sitting in the closet somewhere? Or is it staying in my pocket? Is it full of mold and mildew? Is it rotting away or are we using it? God is gracious to us. He wants us to be stewards of his grace. This reflects the heart of God and incorporates the very words of God himself. It is praying as if God himself were praying these words. God says, these are my words that you are going to pray. Here are my own words to give to them. So the purpose of the grace of God is to bring glory to God. The prayer, this prayer, is speaking and praying as one who speaks the utterances of God himself. Gracious speech can only come from a gracious heart that has been not merely saved, but also converted and is fully controlled by the God of all grace. Holy Father, we come to you, Lord, and we are in need of grace, Lord. And when we think that, Father, help us to remember that your grace is already there. Your throne of grace is already abounding in grace. Your throne of grace in prayer is always already abounding in answers to those prayers. Lord of life, God of all grace, work in each of us. Develop in us a gracious spirit. Nurture in us a heart of grace. Speak through us with words of grace. Bless us to be blessings of grace to others and to be good servants and stewards of your grace as you have given to us to give out and to be a blessing to others. We will ask this in Jesus' name today. Isn't it amazing how close peace and grace are? Did you ever think of that? I was thinking that as he was preaching. Wow, they really go together, don't they? God's peace is there when we minister grace in our conversations and in our living day by day. Let's stand and sing together that chorus. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father In fact. 
Martin Beam and Mrs. Beam, thank you both very, very, very much for uh, uh, filling in. You know, faith doesn't have to be absent for you guys to do this, you know. But, uh, but we certainly appreciate it. And, you know, I'd like to encourage everybody, um, let's just do it this once. Everybody say, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. What if we went out today, just while we're still inside this building, and we're careful about what we're thinking about, we're careful about what we're talking about, uh, chit-chat, <clears throat> but just to everybody that you talk to, first say, grace and peace to you. Did you get that, dear? <laughs> Did you win the game? Did your team win the game? And then go from there, okay? We know there's other conversations, but greet people with a handshake and say grace and peace to you. Somebody might need that today. Holy Father, we gather today in the name of Jesus. We depart today in the same mighty name, Lord, to go out with the grace that you've given us to be uh, your instruments, to be your servants, to be your stewards of grace. What are we going to do with what you've given us? Lord, we want to give it out to others. We want to pour out the grace that you've poured into our lives and tell others about you and lead others to find you and to trust you and to love you and to follow you as well, Lord. Thank you again, Lord, as we go out. Bless us to be, to be servants of grace and peace to others. In Christ's name, amen. Grace and peace to you. Amen.